I had a man in my church in Albert Lee who intimidated me, which I think was really more about my insecurity than it was his intent. But I remember he once came into my office and he said to me, you really hate conflict, don't you? And I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, doesn't everyone? Well, probably not everyone hates conflict. I don't think this guy did. But why is it that when we're having a disagreement that so often it is that we go and talk to someone else about the person we're having a disagreement with rather than talking to the person we're having a disagreement with? Or why do we ghost them? I think one thing that people might find appealing about a congregation of our size is that you can avoid people if you want to. Although it's harder now, I think, with one worship service on Sunday. Or rather than working through a conflict, sometimes people will just leave the church. And sometimes they'll just leave the church and not even tell you that they're leaving the church. They'll just leave. And we figure that there shouldn't be any conflict in the church, right? I mean, we have enough trouble from our boss or from our teenager who doesn't listen. Heck, even our dog doesn't like us. We don't need trouble from our church too, right? You may or may not know that we have a conflict resolution policy here at Bethlehem. And it's based on Matthew chapter 18, which is our gospel for today. In my 14 years here as your pastor, we've used it officially one time, though I think it might have been helpful to pull it out a few other times as well. Now, I don't think anybody wants to be a part of a church that has to use their conflict resolution policy all the time, right? But just like a fire extinguisher, it's not only good to have it around, it's a necessity. And it's a necessity because there really is no such thing as a conflict-free church. That's why Jesus addresses this subject tonight in our gospel. Jesus addresses this subject because we need churches that invite the spirit of the risen Jesus Christ even into our ugliness, even into our conflict. We need churches that can show the world how conflict can be worked through, how by faith in Christ and living in his ways, conflict can be transformed into peace. And so Jesus basically sits his disciples down and says, this is how when you have a disagreement in your church, you work through it. First, he says, quietly take your grievance to the one who sinned against you and see if you get a hearing. And if that doesn't work, go and find two or three people in the community with integrity and take them with you and see if that will resolve the problem. And finally, finally, if you're not getting anywhere, adjudicate the conflict in a public forum before the whole church. Now, churches back then were different than today. There were probably more like 30 or 40 people. And if even then, after all of that, if nothing changes, it might be best for the disaffected one to leave the community of faith. Kind of like sometimes for the sake of health, doctors will remove a part of the body that not only isn't functional, but is undermining other parts. Similar to how we care for the health of the body is caring for the health of the body of Christ. Now, if it comes to that, that doesn't mean blaming or scapegoating. And anger or revenge are never, ever to be the drivers of the process that Jesus lays out. If someone has to leave, they leave with a blessing, with compassion, with the hope that a relationship with the church might be restored and that reconciliation might occur.
In the second half of our text, Jesus does something else. He connects our human relationships with our relationship with God. And the way in which Jesus describes it, that connection is so deep, it's hard to tell even where our relationship with God ends and our relationship with the church begins. Well, the church is obviously not God and God is not the church. Jesus challenges the notion that Christians can be spiritual but not religious if that means forsaking a religious community to love us and hold us accountable in our life of faith. I think on some level, even the most introverted among us recognizes the need for community, for other people. But the problem is, of course, that communities, that churches are made up of people, right? People who can be stubborn and selfish and irritable and unreliable. People like me, maybe like you. Jesus said where two or three are gathered together in his name, he is present. I think Jesus could have also said where two or three are gathered together in his name, there's bound to be conflict. But you know what? That might not be all bad. Because disagreement can lead to growth. It might even be a necessary part of moving a relationship from superficial nicety and platitude to genuine love. When I was working on this sermon, I came across um, some of M. Scott Peck's work on communities. He talks about the different stages that communities go through. The first is what he labeled as pseudo-community. Pseudo-communities begin by being nice, right? Everybody's nice. We pretend like there are no disagreements among us. There's something a little bit uncomfortable. We just sweep it under the rug. But as the community matures, it realizes that genuine and seemingly irreconcilable differences do exist. And then it begins a stage that Peck calls chaos. This is where we practice that method of managing conflict that Jesus talked about. This is a hard time for a community. It's painful. But if it's done right, if it's done right, it's a necessary step to genuine growth. The next stage is what Peck called emptiness. It's the stage when the community realizes individually and together that something is dying, something is being taken away. It involves an emptying, a willingness to be changed. But that leads to the final stage. True community, true communities are marked by empathy and understanding. There's grace. I have an ability to relate to other people's feelings. Discussions, even when they become heated, don't get ugly. Motives are not questioned. People are given the benefit of the doubt. The psalmist wrote how good it is when people live in unity. In true community, it just feels almost blissful. It's like, this is where I belong. It's when we notice the presence of the Christ among us who tells us where two or three come together in his name, he's already there. And I think we can get so kind of caught up in the first part of this text of what Jesus says about managing conflict that we can overlook how profound and amazing the second part of this text is. Our relationships with one another affect how we relate to God. And how our relationship with God impacts how we relate to one another. And Jesus said, I'm with you twos and threes. I'm with you. He doesn't say... If you do this, then I will be with you. Now Jesus says, I'm with you. 
I'm with you in your worship and in your serving. I'm with you in your conflict and in your sin. I'm with you, Jesus says. I'm with you. When I interviewed to be the pastor of that church in Albert Lee, after they got done questioning me, they asked me if I had any questions for them. And so I said, well, I really only have one question, and that is if I become your pastor, I'm also going to become a member of your church, so why should I join your church? And it got really quiet around that table. No one said a thing for a while. And then finally, a couple of people piped up and they said, well, you should join our church because we are nice people here. We are friendly and kind and generous and faithful. We get along very well. And I was kind of cynical, right? I thought, yeah, right? Every church feels that way. At least the people they're going to put on a call committee feel that way. So I was pretty skeptical. But then a young woman spoke up on the call committee and she offered another reason why I should join their church. Do you know what she said? She said, you should join our church because God is here. Because God is here. Wherever two or three gather in Jesus' name, God is here. Amen.